going to talk about not theater initially. We're going to talk about a documentary uh, that Chuck worked on, uh, which is Fast Break to Glory. Uh, and can you tell us a bit about Fast Break to Glory? It was a story about the first African American high school basketball team to go down state and play in the state championship. Uh, when I was a when I was a kid, when I was a, when I was a teenager at Parker High School in Chicago, uh, Dusabo High School was the place to go for basketball. Everybody loved the Dusabo team, and Dusabo went down state the year before. Uh, that was like about '53. And uh, I'm a senior center, by the way, so I, I go for that. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way. So uh, they went down state in 53, and they, uh, they, 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 got, they, they didn't get past the first round. And now the following year, they made it all the way to the state championship. And the game was televised for the first time. And I'm watching it on television. And you could see that they were not going to let those brothers win their game. And they would call it fouls, they would call it uh, uh, traveling, they would call it all kinds of stupid stuff. And uh, uh, there was Charlie Brown, he was, uh, he was a power forward, and Shelly McMillan was a center, and there was, uh, Pastor Lumpkin was, was, a, was a guard. And those, those names are embedded in my head because everybody on the south side of Chicago was following his brother. And we they just went out there and won the game. So they didn't win the game. So I vowed as a kid, I said, that wasn't right, that's not right. Something's gotta be done about that. So what happened was I ended up doing a little film. I said, and I got it out of my system that way. You know? <laughs> so that's how I mean it was years later, you know, of course, but it was still there and I got out of my system by by doing that little doc documentary. Uh, tell, tell a play, that's what it was. It's called Tell a Play. And you want to work for it? Yeah, I did. Uh, actually, I got, I, got, I got a nomination for an award. I, I, I won an award for a piece I did on the Emmett Till murder, uh, which was another thing that was stuck down in there. And uh, I won an Emmy for that one. Yeah. You're nominated as well for one, too. Yeah. For Pastor Story. Yes. Uh, and, and what's amazing about um, you know, the story. Uh, is that I was reminded this summer, uh, thinking about the Chicago <coughs> League, uh, World Series uh, uh, baseball team. Yeah, things uh, have changed. And how things have changed, yeah. and, and how the entire city and the entire state uh, and you know, a huge portion of this country were rooting uh, for you know, these kids to, to bring it home. Yeah. You know? and, how, and, and how Chicago uh, you know, had a, a parade you know, in their honor when they returned. Yeah. Uh, Harry uh, is from the South Shore, uh, and he grew up uh, with, as a kid, with sort of disparate, uh, with, with different uh, aspirations than a lot of kids. Sort of one that might uh, be a bit more holy. So you can see a bit about what you were thinking about doing as you were a kid. Well, yeah, they didn't stay holy. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no, I, uh, when I, when I uh, was a young man, when I was in high school, actually, I was in a high school seminary called uh, Quickly Preparatory Seminary South. Now I think it's like Rita. Some equally unworthy uh, high school. However, oh, no, uh, yeah, so that was my intention was really to be a priest and to go as far in that as possible, not growing up with a father. My father died before I was two. Um, uh, my association with fatherliness, since we call them father, were the priests. And I always wanted to be that for some, for some kids that didn't have that on their own. Uh, and I was able to teach, you know, school. Uh, uh, while I didn't become a priest, of course, I was a school teacher for about eight years in Chicago Public Schools, and I, I continue to be dedicated to working with young people and students. And, and, and how does a kid who uh, initially wants to become a priest discover acting? Well, I, I remember uh, distinctly, I was in elementary school, and they would have a spring musical every year. And one year, I was doing this duet with this young actor, young man, and he froze and he couldn't remember his lines. And uh, I had an aptitude for memorization. And so I was able to do both his lines and my lines. And at that point, uh, when I got to high school uh, at the seminary, uh, the sports that I played really didn't have cheerleaders, like baseball, which I played, and track and field, you don't have cheerleaders. 
and it was an all-boys school. So I saw it, started seeing these girls coming up for the spring play in high school, and I figured that would be a, a neat way to meet <laughs>
Like there's, there's different paths we take in our lives, right? You know, and with each new path, there's a different set of opportunities, right? And different communities are created. Uh, and by returning to Chicago and staying in the city, uh, you know, you became connected with Expat, which then led to the creation of uh, Chicago Theater the Company. Company. company yes. Yeah, and that's where Harry and I met years ago. Um, he was like, Harry, Harry, Harry got his equity card for my show. But he up in a place. I forgive you, Richard. <laughs> That was a play called, called The Meetings. But I had saw Harry uh, at, uh, right soon after he came out of, out of Northwestern, he got uh, got a part of the play, a uh, 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 production of Mar Raiders Black Bottom that Pegasus played over on Bryn Mawr. And he was fabulous in that. <laughs> and I said, oh, wow, someday I got to work with that brother. And uh, so when uh, the meeting is a, is a, is a play about a fictitious meeting between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And when that came, when we were going to do that, I thought, you know, just the guy I wanted for, for Malcolm X, it was Harry. And uh, that led to a, a 20 year collaboration between Harry and I. Uh, we worked it up. We did, we did the meeting all over the country. And we did, uh, uh, after I got on at the, at the Goodman, Harry came and did my ring again and won himself. Uh, and then he came back again for me to do uh, a raise for his son. And that was sort of, that was, I think that was the last time we worked. Last time? Yeah. That was uh, like about 2000. So we have to do it. And, and, and Harry, uh, so when you were at the meeting, you were, you were teaching. Yes. Uh, so what was your life like at that time? Well, I was, uh, you can't make a living in theater, really, unless you're on Broadway, and even then, you know, you have to have some seniority. You can make a living, but it's very, very difficult. And uh, so I supplemented my income with school, and uh, teaching school. And both were serving each other. I mean, I was equally dedicated to uh, education as I was to the craft. Um, I don't really distinguish between the two in some ways. But I, uh, it was difficult, you know, I didn't have a car. I, we, came, uh, we grew up pretty poor, uh, Chuck goes, uh, similar background. But uh, my mom refused to work, uh, refused to, I'm sorry, refused to take any uh, government assistance and decided to work. She had three or four jobs. Uh, I had a job since I was 10 years old. So if I'm not working, uh, I don't feel like I'm being productive. So, while well, it was strenuous, I developed an ulcer during that time, uh, bleeding ulcer, because of the stress of doing two plays at one particular time, and teaching school full time. But uh, I was 23 or 24. I, if I did it now, it would kill me. But, but now I, I do happen to be doing two movies at the same time. Uh, but it's a, it's a much lighter load than when I was 24. So that's. That's what it was like. It was a heady time. August Wilson was just coming on the scene dramatically. Uh, so there was a, a, a wealth of material. There were already existing uh, playwrights of note in the, in the African American, or what I prefer, the black uh, point of view. And there was always Shakespeare. So, I mean, I, I think anywhere in the world where you find actors being put to work doing certain playwrights, you're going to find people migrating uh, to that place like Mecca. Uh, follow the money when it comes to art. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did, and, uh, but I wasn't able to get as much money as I needed, so I taught school. Uh, and, and, and Harry, uh, even today, is uh, still one of the hardest worker, work working actors out there. Uh, he just sensed this. Uh, so last night, uh, he flew in this morning. He flew in oh, no, 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 this morning, like this afternoon, like barely. I got here about noon. Yeah. About noon, he's got here. Uh, so, well, so last night he was shooting uh, the blacklist, um, and then he's here, and then he's going to fly to Detroit to do that man versus Superman, you know, and then he goes back to New York for Black. the blacklist. Um, and you know, so uh, the fact that um, in a moment that's a break, you know, he flew back to the Chicago area to be with us, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I was telling Dr. Dr. Young that I, you know, I, I hung some lights up there, I lifted all kinds, I had crew right in this theater. 
So Northwestern is uh, is eternally important to me, and I'll, I'll be very grateful to, you know, to, to be able to come back. Uh, I, I want the two of you to talk a bit about uh, that collaboration uh, with on my release of Black Bottom. Uh, you know, not only do you have sort of two dynamic uh, uh, figures in Chicago theater, uh, Chuck and Harry, working together, uh, again, having already uh, sort of cultivated a relationship, uh, but you have the entry also of August Wilson, right? Uh, yeah. And that sort of charts other work that you continue to that, produce. That was the actual uh, first time that I had actually worked on an August Wilson play. Mm. And it was, uh, uh, I was quite fortunate because August Wilson, he came to our first preview. And from that point on, he was sort of my assistant director. <laughs> and, and, you know, he uh, helped me shape the play to uh, make it probably one of the most successful plays uh, uh, that I've ever done. This is in 1987 in the old Goodman Theater. And uh, that, that show, uh, at the time, set a good theater box office record, and sort of established me uh, as a as a as a firm. It, it sort of I had been I had been at the Goodman since '92. This is '97, but I was still a little insecure. After that, I was no longer insecure, and so that really kind of bam, you know, gave me the confidence that I needed to uh, to do what I what I do best. It's direct plays without without any pressure on it. Now Harry and I, we have been working together since uh, since over at, at over ten years, about ten years yeah. at that point. Yeah, and so uh, Harry, uh, half <coughs> half for a director, half the job is is casting the right people in the right roles, and uh, with Harry, you, 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 it's kind of hard to go wrong. And, and especially with, between the two of us at the time, because we've been working together for so long, it's not like I have to, to guide him. I can tell him, hey, that he can take whatever I, whatever little nugget I give him, and it just explode into something wonderful. So, uh, but but that and that's 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 always great when you got an actor that you've worked with for, for a while, where you don't, you know, I can give him a look, and he'll know what I'm talking about. Or oh, he'll tell us, Chuck, I'm sorry, I know, I, know, I, I messed up that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, and, and, and move on. So uh, it's just, uh, uh, it's, it, it, was, uh, it was probably uh, the most, the closest I've ever been to any actor is, 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 is Harry, because he, 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 at the time, he was reading my mind, and I was reading his, and so it was, it was just, it was just a wonderful time to be in a rehearsal room. And that's where all the magic really happens in rehearsal, uh, where everything is uh, everything is set between the actors and the director, and making sure everyone's on the same page. So when you get into when you get to the stage, you know it's just a matter of adding all the dressing, the lights, the sound, the costumes. But the actors are set; they know what they, they know what they're doing. All you have to do is adjust, make adjustments to uh, to uh, to the technical part. You know? But uh, I, yeah, I. I tell everyone to this day, you know, working with Harry uh, from the uh, late 80s to the, the late, to 2000, that was probably my most productive part in theater in terms of working with any one particular actor. Very mutual, very mutual. And I, and I would say, you know, Chuck is actually getting into something which, if I may, just to extrapolate on, which is his methodology lined up with mine. And I think that having, August Wilson uh, to work, not, and not just August Wilson, but <clears throat> certainly to have somebody that's extraordinary in terms of dramatic literature uh, is a rare occasion. But Chuck's method, which I think is the Chicago way, at least what is, what is it, it's now an imprint, is that um, you block the scene, you handle all the physical business, you, you know where you're going to be, you, you don't have all of the lines. You develop a muscle memory with your physical space. So moving literally, when I'm over here, I know, oh, that's the line, such and such. Now, I've been able to take that kind of, because Chuck is, uh, Chuck will have the entire play blocked in two days. 
the first day you sit around the table all day, or the first day, and that's the last time you're sitting. <laughs> so you, you, you block the first act on day two. Sometimes you might have your, your butt up there on that very day. You block uh, the second act on day two. Day three, you're running the play. Now, of course, the actor has no way to negotiate what he's doing, no tie with the emotional and the physical and the intellectual and all of these spiritual things that are going to be happening that comes as a function of the chemistry between actors and entities moving parts in a, in a given system, in, in, a, in a system that has continuities like language, dialogue, if you will. We know what we're going to be saying eventually, and by that time, our emotional state and our uh, uh, spiritual state, if you will, has caught up to our physical development. That is knowing where you'll be, and that gives you a tremendous, as, as limiting as it may sound to the uh, uninitiated, uh, it is the most liberating way that I've ever worked in. Even when I'm not working with a director that way, I take that method with me to, to that uh, process. Now, and, and now in, in addition to process, uh, you know, sort of thinking about uh, sort of content, right, and uh, you know, sort of words that are uh, sort of on the page, you know, given uh, by a playwright. Uh, Harry, uh, your uh, career, uh, when it occurs on the screen, in my opinion, often uh, is, uh, it follows you know, one of three, so one of three paths, and we'll focus on two of them, right? You know, one of them being sort of as an interpreter of Shakespeare, right? And another as an interpreter of August Wilson, right? Uh, and putting those two voices together, Shakespeare and Wilson, you know, how do you engage with them as an artist? Yes, this is very interesting. I think, uh, uh, thank you for that question, because I, I love it. It's perhaps um, the single most um, concise way to, to describe my theatrical curiosity, and to that end, to some extent, cinematic curiosity. I don't, think you're, I don't think that the English language has produced, nor any other language that I'm aware of, has produced as prolific and as profound a playwright as William Shakespeare. Whether or not I agree with his assessments or, or general tendencies, he never judges his character. He allows great latitude within those characters, and we, are, we have been told, and I agree, that Shakespeare is universally applicable to the human experience. If that is true, then why do we not get a chance to see ourselves and by ourselves, I'll just say black people and people of color, why don't we see ourselves? When, when it comes time for me to study, by compulsion, uh, Shakespeare, Hamlet, Macbeth, whatever, I said Macbeth in an you know, I really get to see us practicing this craft. Now, I studied as long at Northwestern University as everybody else in my class. But if you go to Broadway, you'd be hard pressed. If you go to England, you'd be hard pressed. Now, less, less difficult to find now. Yeah. And, and, and actually, have sometimes I, I wonder at the kind of reckless interracial casting. Chuck and I may have actually different opinions on that. But I think that in order to make Shakespeare uh, relevant, it has to be, to some extent, recognizable. So I have taken to sh setting, setting Shakespeare into recognizable worlds by the people who are going to be consuming this content, so they're not distracted by the fact that Hamlet's mama is white and Hamlet is black or something. I think that gets in the intellectual way of having an emotional, spiritual, aesthetic experience. So uh, I don't have to do that kind of work, however, that kind of infrastructural plumbing work with August Wilson, it's already set there. And if you look at the, the brilliance of that language, both, both men uh, being adept at, at, at poeticizing prose, or making prosaic poetry, really, which is, which is really what it is, uh, then I think that the potential for resonance with the audience, with the spectator, really, is great. Um, Robert Lepage, the great Canadian, French Canadian uh, artist, always talks about the difference between having an audience and having a spectator. And I think that the, the theater for an American Western society really is, is a matter of spectacle and being able to ideate, to put into, to imagine uh, these circumstances where recognizable figures are doing relatable things. And for me, the, the, the most noble of those aspirations have been in August Wilson and William Shakespeare. And, and Chuck, I know that you're, uh, and, and with the second part of this too, I'm going to give you a chance to talk about what you're currently doing, uh, 
related to it, um, on school center the right. uh, But you know, sort of pull back or head toward that direction. What would you say is the role that August Wilson has played in terms of nurturing uh, you know, some black leaders in Chicago? Well, not only in Chicago, but uh, but uh, but all over the all over the country, and now I could even say, at least over in London, uh, August Wilson is 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 recognized as as probably the most important playwright of our time. So I'm not saying the best, but I, I, what I will say. Uh, most important, mainly because of the body of work. The man has actually written one play of each decade of the 20th century. That's quite a feat for any living, for quite a while, he's gone now, but you know, for any playwright to do something like that. And each one of these plays are standalone plays. They don't need one, you don't need one play to relate to another play. You can do any one of these plays without even knowing about any of the others. And you will have a wonderful theatrical experience. Uh, his, his works are being done all over the country in all in, in, in major houses and in, 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 in non-major houses. <coughs> so once upon a time it was well we don't have any, you know the, the major houses were saying we don't have any good black plays out there so that's why we're not doing them. Well that excuse is null and void now. Not only because of Walter Wilson, but you know there's there's so many others who followed in his footsteps who come up with some wonderful work. And, and some who proceeded. And some who proceeded, you know. But 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 now the 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 one thing you can't say is that there's nothing out right. there, you know. August Wilson just stamped that one into the ground, you know. Just says, hey, lay lay it for that. Yeah, his ten right here. <laughs> which, which one do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what are you currently doing uh, in relation to August Wilson and the anniversary of this? Time? Well, uh, next year it'll be. Ten years since he since he passed on, and uh, as uh, part of uh, our our 90th anniversary season at the Goodman, we're going to do an August was the play. I'm going to direct uh, two trains running, and during the run, <laughs> it'll, uh, it'll start performances in, in, uh, on March 7th. And during the run of two trains running, we're going to do an August was the celebration where all of the other plays in the August Wilson cycle will be read at different locations throughout the city of Chicago and at Northwestern and at the Evanston Library. So Evanston is included, Northwestern is included. Uh, Harvey, Harvey is helping me put this whole thing together. Uh, but there'll be uh, readings of the other plays. There'll be seminars uh, on August Wilson. August Wilson is Chicago. August Wilson in St. Paul, August Wilson in Yale, August Wilson in New York. They'll be have uh, the uh, August Wilson in St. Paul will be here in Northwestern. Uh, there will also be uh, evening of August Wilson and some of August Wilson's non-published poetry. Uh, and we're setting up two nights of music inspired by August Wilson. And we're working on, a, on a, just a few more, maybe one or two more engagements. But these are, you've gotten the first in all this. So uh, in terms of, you know, an audience. Uh, but if that's what's going to be happening during the, uh, during the run of two trains running, which will run from uh, uh, March 7th through uh, April 19th. Now, in, in the audience, I'm assuming, because I can't really see it in the dark, um, but there are uh, a number of first year Theater majors. Uh, <laughs> and my question for you two, um, you know, in light of their awesome, amazing presence, <laughs> uh, uh, is what advice would you give uh, a first year college student uh, pursuing a career in theater and film? Get out now while it's early. <laughs> 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 invest in Alibaba. <laughs> 
No, listen, uh, my, you know, if I may, just oh, jump in yeah. real quick. Um, I think the first thing is, it says in Shakespeare, to thine own self be truth. And I, I would say that in this regard. Uh, Anthony Hopkins is one of my mentors. I've had a chance to work with him a couple of times. Uh, he's always very interesting, talks this way, of course. <laughs> but he says, um, he said, you know, he always wanted to be rich and famous. Now I find that stunningly honest for an actor. Actors like to think, uh, artists like to think that we are doing something noble, and, and perhaps we are. <clears throat> but the real reason, I think Chuck alluded to this, uh, we have a lot in common looking for girls to the theater. <laughs> but I think <clears throat> but artists really are supposed to be having a good time. You're supposed to entertain people and to educate people while you go on, inform them, if not educate. Uh, and you have to be honest with what, do you want to be movie stars? Do you want to be theater stars? Do you want to do the great literature of the theater for no money? Or do you want to do some of that and also do, you know, explore the increasingly important and relevant uh, mediatized uh, entertainment? I think in a lot of ways, theater is a dying form. It's increasingly obsolete, I think. It's increasingly expensive, increasingly for an elite people, ticket holders, and so forth and so on, I think that the potential of reaching people, if that's what you're intending to do, uh, is great, and you should attempt it across all platforms. However, if you want, if you still haven't heard this, decide that you want to be theater actors, which is what you're being trained for here, largely, at least when I was here, uh, then you have to study, and you have to study by learning what, you, what you're going to be doing next year, to some extent this year, learning the literature of the theater. Now, that library is expanding. And I think you find, you know, there are still people doing important work uh, in New York, in Chicago, uh, all over the world. Um, but literature, literature, and learning how to read, how to be a thinking actor, and what methods work for you. No one work, one, no one method uh, holds dominance, I don't. I really don't believe it. it does. So, yeah, but I think literature first and then self reflection second. What is it that you want? I, I, I go along with that. Uh, mainly, uh, uh, what you're going to discover, or what you probably already discovered, that theater is hard work. And if you're not willing to work hard, just leave, don't, don't do it. Leave it alone. Go, go somewhere else. It hurts. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and know that. Uh, uh, you gotta, you gotta be willing to suffer once you graduate because you're gonna graduate with this degree and all these wonderful roles that you had when you were in school that you're gonna, gonna go get out to the our world and you're not gonna get nothing for a while and it's gonna be hard and you're gonna have to suffer so you gotta be willing to do that uh, but uh, I think what Harry said to thy own self be true that that lies at the heart of it uh, actors actors have to act. They have to act. Harry, Harry does what he does because he has to do. There's a passion in there that, a, that an actor has that there's nothing else will set up, satisfy him. If you don't have that passion, find your passion, whatever it is. But don't mess around with acting. Let, let the actors act. If, if, but, but there's a lot, there's so, much, so many other things in this field, in this business that you can do. You know, uh, you can direct, you can produce, you can do so many things. But if, if you know, if you gotta find what, what it is that, that, that makes you, that, that pushes you. With me, it's, it's directing and producing. I get a real charge out of that. I was an actor once, I still pay equity dues, but that's not my thing. I've done television, I won an Emmy, but that's not my thing. I have to deal with theater. That's my passion. I have to direct on, I have to direct or produce plays. That's what I do. And if I didn't do that, I would be very unhappy. And you gotta find that thing, you know, it's great. Know that theater is, has, has all these different different fields, but to that own stuff be true. You know what, you know what turns you on. And and go for it. And don't let nobody change it. If once you once 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 you find your thing. You go with it, and don't let anybody tell you. And another thing, watch out. Don't make babies too soon.
Um, uh, you know, what I think is, you know, amazing about people who dedicate themselves to theater and film and the arts is that they're entering a field in which there's lots of rejection, right? Um, you know, as an actor, you're going to a field in which people can say no to you based upon whether you're the right look, you know, for a part, right? Uh, regardless of your talent, you know, sort of how you look could actually determine whether or not you can advance, right? Um, you know, you audition for roles against a lot of people who are well qualified and hungry, uh, and only one person can cast. There's lots of no's that you receive. Um, but what I think that you would can see here is that, you know, when you're true to yourself, right, when you're persistent with the craft, uh, when you don't give up, you don't let no uh, stop you, be an obstacle, uh, you can have rich, rewarding, full lives. And I think that we have two people here uh, who are sitting on stage on a wonderfully red couch. Um, you know, that demonstrates that, you know, if you don't let that no get in your way, that if you are true to yourself, if you have that drive and that passion, great things can happen. You can impact communities that are positive, and you can you create roles that will, uh, not only inspire people to follow your own path, but can also give them a chance to see themselves on screen, in some cases for the first time. You know, so uh, for those of you who are out there considering the craft uh, and a career in the arts, uh, it's a challenge, it's difficult, but I hope that you, know, you can find some inspiration, uh, even with the caution, uh, you know, from the folks who are sitting here, you know, at this, on this couch. Does that make sense? All right. I want to ask one more question, and what we're going to do is we're going to open it up uh, for a Q&A, and then the lights will come up, and then we'll do a see you, you know, about the interesting silhouettes. Uh, and, and what that is, is I, I want you to get a sense of, you know, what do you think is the sort of the state or future of black theater, uh, either in Chicago or in the country at large? Well, unlike Harry, I, I think there's a, there's, 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 uh, there'll always be uh, an actor on stage in an audience watching an actor on stage. Uh, I, I, yes, yeah, uh, almost every every uh, every theater piece, or well, 50% of the theater pieces you, you see now have some sort of video attached to it. You know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to that as long as it w works with what's really happening and that's identifying with the character on stage. Uh, because there is, I think there'll always be that that uh, emotional thing between an act, between, between what's going on stage and the audience, a live audience, and opposed to watching things on, on, on the screen. I, and, and as far as black theater in the, city, in the city of Chicago and all over the country, I think uh, uh, it's gonna, it's, 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 it's always, <laughs> it's, theater's, theater's difficult, period. Black theater now is less difficult than it used to be, but it's it's difficult because it's it's, it's theater. Uh, we have lots of great African uh, uh, actors of color, African American actors, black actors, however you want to refer to them. We've got lots of choice. There's choices to be made. Uh, there's lots of plays that could be produced. What uh, uh, I find is the major stumbling block is uh, is producers. There's just not enough producers uh, to go around for, and there's not enough. Uh, fortunately, Chicago is, is is rich. We do have uh, forward-thinking individuals here in the city, like Jackie Taylor, who has just built a brand new theater a couple of years ago. And Jackie Taylor, we need more Jackie Taylors. We, don't, we need more people thinking like that about building spaces for these things to happen. Yeah. That's, that's what I, uh, if there's anything, and, when I, and, I, and I said we need, we need producers, we need individuals who want to be making things happen in opposed to being on the stage. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's my, 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 my view of the whole situation. That's what we need. We got everything is in place. We just need more. We just need more spaces. Yeah, yeah I think you know, Chuck and I are very honest with each other. We go back and forth. We've been doing this now for a long time. Yeah. 
But my, uh, my general theory about the state of things, uh, the state of the art, if you will, is that you've got a, an increasing need for broad bandwidth in terms of what people are getting. They are hungry for things we know. Uh, they go to see things that are not necessary. So to me, it's not a lack of content. It's not hard to find black movies. It's not hard to find black plays. A lot of it depends on how you define black plays in theater. I mean, Tyler Perry and David, uh, whatever, all those other people who are making these things, uh, that's theater. And if people are, are liking it and they fill out, you know, fill up huge auditoriums like this, and they do, um, then that has to be considered theater. Now, what they're eating, what they are consuming, I find these days to be troubling, or at least uh, not a satisfying meal. I think that you've got increasingly small bandwidths. I think you've got agendas being given artistic expression that do not satisfy the most basic root needs of the people, either spiritually, artistically, uh, critically, intellectually. And, and so I think that you've got a lot of people being served substandard material and out of a sense of what I would say misplaced racial pride or something, or loyalty, uh, have been given to consuming things that send terrible messages in large. Uh, although, if you wish to go back in time and look at the plays of Lorraine Hansberry, Alice Childress, uh, uh, Baldwin, these people, uh, August Wilson, I think that you will find a more satisfying meal. In the current iteration, you've got people like uh, to Robert Craney, Lynn Nottage, yeah, yeah. you know, so you've got, you've got playwrights, Lydia Diamond, who went to school here. Yeah. Um, so you've got uh, writers who are not really being supported by those people who claim most to want better representation. So I think that there's a disconnect, there's a need uh, for better nourishment, for better plays, for better skill. The skill. I tell you, there's so much, Chuck alluded to it, there's so many talented actors and writers who are forced or relegated to doing substandard garbage because the patrons who, uh, who are being serviced by the producers and the writers and directors are not going out and seeking it out or funding it. They give lip service and they have all the, they express all these high-minded things, but they eat the equivalent of you know 99 cent hamburgers at the window. <laughs> That said, the, the theater suffers from, I think, a lack of exposure and a lack of support from the states, from the cities, and so people are being forced to pay $50, $100. It's your conference here, $50. That's outrageous to me, where you can go and stuff like even in New York, you can stand online, get tickets. You know, they need to have some way, some initiative, if theater is continuingly relevant then we need to start putting our money where our mouth is. And as a former uh, educator who taught music uh, and then got my job cut and seeing the lack of investment that the public and the private individuals are giving toward the arts and toward these expressions, then you see the results of it. And I think that what the, the results that you see are played out every day and made manifest uh, across the landscape. So if you see a black boy walking in Kmart, with a, plastic gun that he bought there, or that didn't bought it yet, see. Somebody makes a call and they shoot him. That's a, to me, that has a direct, uh, uh, you can trace that back to the fact that what people are seeing about us in theaters, uh, in television, on the news, and even in fiction, is disturbingly inappropriate and disturbingly uh, um, wrong. wrong. But that's all hard to this early. I said, the only place I, I, I'm looking at, we're sitting here, you're writing books, he's doing great scholarship, he's, we have a lot of friends, got, my dear friend Peter Erickson is in the audience, he's a professor here, I got over here, brilliant man, wrote a seminal book about blacks in, 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 the, in the media, the theater, and so forth. The only place I can't see Harvey Young is in a movie, or on television. I see people raping their daughter, being slaves, and things of this age. So 
or, or whatever, doing things that they ought not to be doing, who everybody can say is wrong, and these bad things do happen. But I find that there's a, 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 a critical lack of perspective uh, and a critical lack of the whole spectrum being played out because we're so eager to please people and give people what we think they want, which sends out wrong messages which have lethal impact in the real world. These wrong messages make money for the producers, and that's why they've been doing. That's why they're done. Hard, putting our putting, putting our Harvey on in, in a film is not going to make money. So. They, <laughs> I'm going to make a fortune from it. This is great. Let's go for the lights up in the house here and open it up. Uh, oh, there, there you are. There you uh, There is somewhere. Uh, there's, you know, you know, we're recording this, so uh, please uh, use the microphone. Hi, Harvey. Um, I'm Leslie Williams, and I work at Galaxy Public Library, and uh, we've been doing it here. Eleven months of African American history every month except February. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I went into Barnes and Noble a couple days ago, and they only had two August Wilson plays on the shelf, just piano and fences. And I'm wondering at what point you think August Wilson will really completely permeate the canon, not just in places like Chicago and New York, but in Dubuque and Poughkeepsie and all over the country, so that every high school kid is reading August Wilson the way they read Shakespeare, and every bookstore is going to have as many copies of Jitney as they do of Macbeth. Uh, let, 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 me, let me just take it back on that. Uh, I'm with you 100%. Uh, I, a quick little story. I, I'm an artist in residence at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was down there uh, about six months ago, and they asked, what do I have coming up? And uh, I told them about this August Wilson celebration that I was putting together. And I looked out and I'm looking at a bunch of blank faces. And I'm saying, I say, what you guys do know who August Wilson is, don't you? And it's a room of like about 30. And two people raised their hands. And this is at an this is at a, 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 a black historical college. And I said, oh my God, you guys don't know who August Wilson is? So naturally, I gave a quick little thing, but <laughs> the point is, when I came back home, I said, we got to do something. So this whole celebration has the underlying, uh, uh, the subtext of keeping all this Wilson alive. So I'm also bringing in, I'm, uh, 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 I'm having what I, uh, what I'm, uh, as, part of, as part of the celebration, it's going to be an August Wilson summit. I'm bringing in directors and theater personnel and also uh, administrative people from the black historical colleges to the city of Chicago and discuss ways we can keep August Wilson's name alive. And, and that goes, we're going to be working with high schools too. But that's what it's going to take. Somebody, there's got to be a concentrated effort. Because, I mean, if, 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 if the black historical, co if, 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 the, if, if the black colleges ain't talking about August Wilson, then we got a real problem. Yeah. Well, I'm concerned. So something's got to be done, and that's, that's part of what I'm, I'm working on. Question over here. Hello. I just really wanted to make a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. My queen and I, we always have conversations no matter how uncomfortable they get, just because we like to talk to each other about things. And so she brought me here today. And I haven't watched TV in about two or three years. And people always say, what happened to not watch TV? Because we're so dependent on it. It's such a part of our lives. But the reason is, basically, what both of you said, is uh, it's boring. There's a lot of basic subjects, sex, drugs, violence, and most movies have explosions in them of some kind for some reason. And uh, we need more brave producers, brave screenwriters, and brave actors and actresses that turn down roles and say, no, there's more to life than just me being a slave or a prostitute or a gangster or something, and then turn around and complain. But for me, I got a pocket full of money. I'm not spending money going to get tickets to anything or to you know, I'm paying cable for no reason because I'm bored. I'm an intellectual, I got two college degrees, like let's go, give me something else to look at and talk about, think about. So I agree with you, and uh, that's it. <laughs> Hi, um, I'd like to just offer to you that those students 
at this are the very same students that are being educated in our public school system. And so when we do not feed them the information to empower them, they are left knowing about McMath and out damn spot and all this good stuff. We really do need to support those things that are being standardized in our school system as it relates to literature and what's important and what's not important. You know, uh, as a teenager, I have the thing about dissenting. There have been lots of times where I've been pushed down because there are there's a certain way I act that is a bit brash. And knowing, knowing me, I do not like it. So if there's any other time that you felt that you've been pushed down because of what you wanted to like go against, like, you know, um, maybe I wanted to do a character. Okay. For no reason at all, just because. There's not an abundance of that in theater, you know. And there's not an abundance of color characters. But once upon a time, though, there, there, there is a wealth of literature out there uh, and, and roles to play, even as a teenager. All you gotta do is seek them out. You, I mean, for real, there's, 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 there's quite a few roles that you could play. Right. Uh, and, and with all these, there's, there's, there's one woman, one, one, one person shows all over the city, she not all over. Uh, on Lincoln Avenue, a uh, group called Impact. Once every three months, they got solo jams. Well, solo performances are being being held, you know, and, and it's not all, you know, of all, and they, it, it runs across the spectrum. There's a lot going on. Uh, just keep your eyes open, and, and, and you can find something connect, that you can connect with, believe me. I, I would just say to the sister, I, I hear the pain in your, in your voice. And I, and, I, and I understand the frustration of wanting to create something in an environment where we are told it's a free environment and, and it's a universe, all of these things. And I, I would just, I would ask you to think about it in a different, to approach it in a different way, not out of a sense of lack. Actually, the Apostle Paul says, I speak not in terms of want, because I have learned in all things. He said, he gets on to say, that he's learned to be content with whatever state he's in. I would say the state of us, we have a lot of literature, as Chuck is, as Chuck is alluding to. And I don't think it's about having to stand against something, but to stand for something. And so in other words, forget about what people are allowing you. Do it your own black self. There's no reason, there's nothing preventing you from, from creating a theater company of your own. Producers. Producing your own. Doing what I say, whatever. Who's, no one is preventing you except for in here where you're saying, well, they don't want me to or they want to help with the no. Go make it happen for yourself. That's right. Thank you. Here, I, I need to bring it to a close, but I want to close by saying a, a few things. Uh, the first thing is I hope that you know, the conversation that we have just had has helped everyone realize we're all part of the same sort of larger community, right? Uh, and that we all experience these uh, setbacks, these pushbacks, these sort of uh, limiting expectations of others, right? And what we should do is we should work together to sort of remove those barriers, but also realize that when we encounter those barriers ourselves, you know, to acknowledge that we're not alone in encountering those things and to say, I can draw strength from the fact that others are experiencing the same thing and they overcame and I will push overcome. And then I can actually recruit others. I can sort of email Harvey and reflect in here. Uh, I, I, I can connect with Harry, I can connect with Chuck and Goodman, I can connect with people who are in this space to change things. You know, one example I want to give is uh, the African American Arts Alliance in Chicago, and both Chuck and I serve the board of that. Uh, and it's, 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 it's that community, it's that uh, activism, it's that responsibility uh, that is important. I hope you sort of hear all those things. Uh, so, in addition to that, you know, and the fact that we clearly need to have Harvey Young as a professor on screen some more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> please join me in thanking Chuck and Harry for that.